me begin by thanking you for inviting me. It's a real treat to, to be here and um, uh, to be part of your organization uh, for, um, for the afternoon. I really admire what, you're, what you are doing um, because it helps both um, people and the bees. And uh, even though we won't be, none of us will be in, seeing any swarms for about six months, I think you'll find this talk intriguing because it's about a part of the honeybee's biology that is, well, it's, it's to my mind, it's, the, it's one of the most remarkable aspects of their biology in their organization. And it has practical value as well to understand how these bees choose their homes. So without further um, ado, I will um, jump, jump into my talk. Let's see. There we go. That one. The title is Honeybee Democracy. And um, that might seem like a strange thing to think about. Democracy, we usually think in terms of it's for humans, human group decision making, but it, it, it turns out it applies very, very much to, to honeybees as well. Why is that? Well, the essence of democracy is that it's a form of government in which the power, the supreme power is invested in the people and is it then exercised by them directly or indirectly through a system of representatives. And, the, and here's where it, you can start to see how that applies to honeybees because it's, it's a means whereby decisions that apply to the group, i.e. a colony, are made by the group, members of the colony, not by, not by a dictator or a ruling matriarch. In other words, not by the queen in the case of the bees. Um, we all know that the queen is a mother. She's a mother of everybody in the colony, uh, but she's certainly not a ruler. She doesn't make really any of the decisions about the functioning of a colony. And instead, the power in a honeybee colony is vested in the workers and it's exercised by them directly. It's the workers that decide where they're going to go and collect the food, whether to turn the um, temperature up or down in, in the nest, whether to build more combs, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking, we look at honeybee democracy in terms of the house hunting process. We're gonna be looking at a part of their democracy, but not the full story, of course. And oh, I think it's useful to, to look at, to address this question. Why, why should we look at a natural system like a honeybee colony um, to understand how democratic decision-making can work, can work really well? And the answer is, is as follows that human groups often are not super skilled at making good decisions. These would be human groups that try to make collective decisions or work as a group to make a decision or things like investment committees, customer service teams, task forces, members of the faculty in, a, in, a, in an academic department. <laughs> they have to work together, but they're often not very good at it. And the honeybees, give us a great example of how to do it well. And I'm not the first person to make this claim by any means. Um, there's a, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a gentleman, James Surowiecki, who wrote this influential book called The Wisdom of Crowds. And his main point in his book was that with the right organization, and I emphasize right organization, groups can be remarkably intelligent, often smarter than the smartest individuals in them. And uh, what he was not so clear on in his book, because he, uh, he didn't know yet about the bees, <laughs> is what the right organization is. He, he put out a lot of good ideas, but we've learned from the bees some very clear elements of whereby a group can function well in making it's group decisions. And I will, call, I call these the five habits of highly effective hives. 
And we'll come back to those. We'll look at those at the end of this talk, what they are. Okay. Now, let's review what a honeybee swarm is. And probably most of you know this, but let's review it. It's a reproductive propagule of a honeybee colony. It's a bunch of bees, about 12,000 worker bees on average, and one queen bee, the mother queen, that's left the parent colony, has flown out, has assembled into a, a swarm cluster, and here it, it is homeless at this point. It needs to find a protective home. And for bees, for our part of the world, this is a matter of life and death. They, they won't get through the winter without, without building their nest in shelter. And one of the things that's remarkable about this search for the new home is it's made by a fairly small group of bees. It's only about 3% of the bees in the swarm. That's still three, 300 to 500 bees in a swarm. But when you think about it, compared to the whole mass of the swarm, it's a very selective, it's a very small portion of the swarm. And interestingly, it's these scout bees are um, drawn from the ranks of the most elderly bees in the swarm, the ones that have had the most experience uh, roaming around the countryside during foraging. But even more, these scout bees, if you look inside their brains and you look at the patterns of gene activity, uh, the activity of the genes that are involved in learning, um, you would see that the, those genes are very highly turned on very active um, for these bees, these scalp bees. And why is that? It's because they have to go out and learn a lot of things. They'll be, as will be seen shortly, they have to go out, find sites, learn new locations of these potential home sites, inspect these potential home sites, and then come back and, and keep going. Now, what are these scalp bees looking for? Well, these two images will give you a good sense of what the dream, what a dream home is for honeybees. And uh, I won't go through in detail how we know what the, these features, what, what the bees want. That's a whole, um, that was about uh, six years of work, working this out, but I'll just summarize it. When a scout bee goes out and looks for, checks out a potential home site, seeks a potential home site, what she's looking for ideally is a site, a, a cavity that has a high entrance opening, more than 15 feet or five meters, whatever units you like. Ideally, this site will have just a small entrance, less than three square inches, less than 20 centimeters squared. It will be um, a moderately spacious cavity, 1.4 cubic feet or about 40 meters. And if possible, if they can find one that has all of those traits and it's already furnished with combs from a previous colony, then that's wonderful. So those are the main things. And, um, and you might wonder why do they want all the, what is it about these features? Well, that high entrance uh, makes their nests less conspicuous to bears. Right? Where I live, they're in the forest, there are black bears. And if the bees nest low, the, the black bears can, find their nests easily. High up, they don't find them. Small entrance, that makes the nest easily guarded. Spacious cavity, well, again, in this part of the world, they need that much storage space, which is about this volume of one deep Langstroth hive body. They need that much storage space to store up the 40 pounds of honey they'll, they'll need to get through the winter. And if they can find combs in the cavity, that's great, because that saves them a lot of energy and work building their new, having a for their nest. Oh, and I should say, I first should have said at the beginning, what you see there on the right is the nest that's in the tree on the left. I, I cut off that section of the tree, got lowered it to the ground and split it open. And so it reveals the nest. And it's just like in our hives. It's brood combs near the bottom of the nest and there's drone comb at the very bottom of the nest and honey stores up near the top. This nest is rather unusual in that the entrance is near the upper part, is in the upper part of the nest. Usually the bees really like the nest entrance to be near the bottom, but this one's an exception.
Now, the fact that bees are choosy about their home sites tells us that um, they must inspect potential home sites very carefully. And let me share a little bit about how this works. If you're a scout bee and you're out searching around, what you do is uh, you go up and down trees looking for a dark opening, like a knot hole or a crack in the tree. And if you find one, you will go inside it. And what is shown here on the, on the left are the tracings of the movements of the first scout bee that inspected an experimental nest box that I set up where I could track the movements of the bee inside the, the box. So she came in through a little entrance hole here. And on her first visit, she walked around a little bit, didn't go all the way around in the cavity, and then went back out. And she made a total of 25 visits. By the eighth visit, she was still just working near the entrance. But by the time she got to her 17th visit, she was walking around more deeply and may even making some short flights inside the cavity. And on her last visit, she was moving all around inside the cavity. And this takes a bee typically about 30 minutes, sometimes more, sometimes less. And during that time, she evidently is measuring the volume. I think that's why she walks around inside there so much. She's measuring the cavity's volume, the size of the entrance opening. She's probably also checking out whether it has combs from a previous colony in it. She may be inspecting it to make sure there's no ants living in the cavity and those sorts of things. So she makes it, it's a private evaluation at first. And then if she likes it, she will come back to the swarm and make a public report. And Real quick, Dr. Seeley, just want to, uh, yeah. there may, there's, there's a few people that's still in the waiting room. Are you able to allow those guests in? Oh, okay. How do I do that? Let's okay. see. Or if I, if I can quickly reclaim host oh, I can do for it. you. Yeah, I can okay. do that. Okay, perfect. Perfect. And there's a, if everyone can make sure their, their profiles on mute, I think DD Gamble, if you can mute your phone or computer. Okay, looks and like we're ready now. Just one other person may be on mute. If we can make sure everyone's on mute. I think everyone's on mute. Okay, we all set. Thank you, perfect. Sorry about that. No problem. Oh, one other person's on mute. It's uh, Al Widdish. Make sure your phone or computer's on mute. There you go, perfect. Awesome, sorry about that. Okay. Apologize for not realizing that I needed to do the admissions. <laughs> okay. Let's see. So let's, Matt, we're back to the point of where Scout B has gone Scout out. Scout. She's poked around. She's found a potential home site. If she likes it, she'll come back and do a waggle dance to advertise it. And I'm depicting here a bee dancing on a comb, but the waggle dance will be by the Scout Bees, it will be. Uh, those are performed on the surface of the swarm cluster. And probably everybody who's listening here knows that when bees do a waggle dance, they indicate the direction and distance to something, either a patch of flowers or in this case, a new home site. But they also indicate the, the quality of that target that they're advertising, be it a flower patch or a potential home site. And let me show you just a little, play a little video to show what a scout bee looks like when she's dancing on a swarm, because she does it on the surface of the swarm. Here we go. Walking right on the backs of the non-scouts. And you can see, I hope the video is coming through. I hope you can see that other bees are tagging along with the dancer facing her getting the information about the direction and distance. Did that come through okay? Hope so. Oops, don't need to play that again. And 
as I mentioned, when a bee does this waggle dance, she's indicating the location, the direction and the distance. And just to review, the direction is indicated by the angle of the waggle runs relative to straight up. So for example, if she, if a bee was, were advertising a patch of flowers, wanted to advertise this patch of flowers, when she gets back to her nest, she would have noted that the flowers are in the direction 40 degrees to the right of the direction of the sun. So when she does her waggle dance, she does the waggle run at an angle of 40 degrees to the right of straight up on the combs. Straight up is always the reference direction, be it on the combs or on a side of a swarm. And she indicates the distance by the duration of the waggle runs, how long, how many seconds this portion of the dance lasts. The greater the distance to a food source or a nest site, the greater the duration of the waggle run. It's a very simple but effective system of communicating. And I, sh I don't want to downplay it though, because there's only two species of animals on the whole planet that have this ability to remotely indicate the location of a rich resource. And one of those species is ourselves, of course, and the other one is the honeybee. So it's, it's pretty, it is very special. And the bees that were on, on a swarm, the side of a swarm, you see, we saw bees facing the dancer, pressing up to get close to her. Um, they follow her, they get the information, then they themselves go out and inspect the site. Um, they don't just take it, they, they will only, they make their own personal inspection. They don't take it on the word, so to speak, of the dancing bee that it's a good site. And this is an important point. A site has to be, a, in a sense, approved or checked out by really dozens, if not a hundred or more scout bees for it to be a chosen, to be chosen by the swarm. And so that's all background. What I want to do now is tell you what I've learned about how the bees make the decision. We've looked at what they want in a home site. We've looked at how they use the that they use the waggle dance to uh, share information about a home site, but I haven't told you how they actually do it. And the way I worked out how they do it is I created swarms where every where I was able to track the behavior of every bee in the swarm. I had to make a swarm where all 4,000 bees were labeled for individual identification. And I had to label them all because I didn't know which ones would become the scout bees. So I'd make a swarm like we see here. I'd mount it on this board or swarm mount where the, the queen, I put the queen in a cage and she was mounted here. And then the cluster of bees would cluster on this side of the board. And so I could, um, I think there's somebody that needs to mute their microphone. I'm not sure. Yeah. Is that, something, uh, is that something I can do or? It's already done. Thank you. I think he okay. just muted his so. Okay, good. So the bees are, the, the, this mass of 4,000 bees is mounted on this board. The dancing bees are on, will dance on the outer surface of the, of the uh, swarm cluster. And I'd even put a little screen platform for them to dance on over it. And there were little bottles of sugar water, so they never went hungry. And, and I could record all the dances done on the surface of the swarm by the scout bees. And moreover, I could tell for each dance which bee did the dance. <laughs> so I could watch, could watch the buildup of the popularity of, of different sites. And what I want to do now is go through this diagram, which shows the debate that was performed on one swarm over 16 hours total time, in which the scout bees discovered and debated among themselves about 11 different sites. And this debate involved 149 scouts. So that's, a, a, that's as I say, that's a, a small percentage of the bees in a swarm but it's still a sizable number of bees. Now, this is the most important slide of this talk, so I'm gonna go through it carefully. Uh, what we see is from each of these 
plots is a diagram that shows where the scout bees are, where the, are the sites that the scout bees are advertising with their dances. So in this diagram, this circle represents the swarm and each of these arrows pointing out represents a site. And so this site A, for example, was a site to the east that bees were advertising with dances. Now, so the direction of the arrow indicates the compass direction. The length of the arrow indicates the distance to the site. And here's the units down here in kilometers. Uh, kilometers 0.6 miles. So this site was about 1.2 miles away, two kilometers. And the width of each arrow indicates how many bees during the given time period, usually, and they're usually two hour long time periods from 11 to one, how many bees performed a dance to uh, advertise that site? In this case, it was uh, for this two hour time period, for this site, it looks like it was about um, not quite 10 bees, 10 different bees. And we can also see that during this first two hour time period, the scout bees had reported in, on, had found other sites, not just this one to the east, there was one to the southeast, south, southeast, one to the south, one to the north, and one over here to the towards the west. So that was just but that was just the first two hours. The next two hours, and this is all on the this is this top row is all on the first day, the 20th of July. Next two hours, it's a, it's a lot like this, only there's even more possibilities being announced by the scout bees. And that site to the east is still being advertised. Uh, the site to the south is still being advertised, but, but a new site and an important site is, is being advertised to the southwest, site G. And then there's various other ones as well. Now we move to the time of 3 to 5 p.m., to the end of the afternoon. Site A is still an important site, but sites B and G are really getting most of the action. There's more dancing for B and G than there is for any of the other sites. So things are kind of starting to take shape. And then here we are at the end of the day, between 5 and 7 p.m. Again, the pattern is firming up. It's either site B or sites B and G are the most heavily advertised by the dancing scout bees. And at this point, we didn't know which, we figured it would be either this site to the south or this other site to the southwest, but we didn't know which one would win. So we made bets. Uh, I lost the bet. I bet on the south. <laughs> Turned out it was the southwest. So next morning, things started up where they basically where they had left off the previous uh, evening. Site this site B to the south and site G to the southwest were the really the only strongly advertised sites. And as you can see, over the rest of this morning, site G to the southwest became more and more popular, more and more dominating of the discussion. We thought this the, the scouts decision making would end that day, the 21st of July, but it started raining right before noon and it was a, it was a rainy afternoon. So these the, the dancing ended at 11:54. And the next morning, though it was fortunately the next morning it was nice and sunny and as you can see, every scout bee that danced, on the on the 22nd of July was advertising this site to the southwest and at 1158 the swarm took off and flew to the southwest. Now I don't know where that site was because I was I had set up this swarm just outside my laboratory at Cornell and there are woods and forests around so but it was some tree out to the southwest um, at the distance of indicated here. I should have explained that there's a distance scale down here. So it's about not about a mile away, two, not quite two kilometers away to the southwest, but I don't know what tree it was. So the general point, the reason I'm stressing this diagram is it, it shows, I think, very clearly, uh, I think it's actually one of the best scientific illustrations I've ever made of how the information shifts from scouts have found a variety of potential home sites and then they run a kind of competition and bit by bit, they, it, they narrow it down to one site and they go to that site. Pretty amazing. 
But this is just the pattern. And what I want to talk about now is what's the process that produces this coalescence of interest on one site. And in fact, it's not just one site, it's the best site. Now, how do I know that the scouts choose the best site? Well, I gave them, I gave Swarm's multiple choice tests to, te to test their decision making ability. Here's how it worked. Um, the way I was able to do this is I was, a, I found a location, it was an island off the coast off the coast of Maine, state of Maine, where there are no trees. So I could put out, and here we are, Boston is down here, and you go up I-95, <laughs> and you get out at a town called Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and then I could take a boat out to this, this set of islands out here. Yeah. And one of these islands, um, Cornell University has a marine laboratory on it. And so, and just by chance, not only does it, was there a marine laboratory in this island, but there are no trees on this island. So I figured, hmm, I bet I could go out here and under these conditions, the scout bees wouldn't find trees, so they'd have to choose among experimental nest boxes that I put out so I could give them, I could test them. And here's what this habitat looks like. It's rocky, it's scrubby, no big trees. In fact, the nearest trees that would offer natural home sites are six miles away on the mainland, 10 kilometers away. That's too far for the scout bees to go and it's over the water. So they don't go, they don't go back to the mainland. And here's what I did. I would take, a, I would take swarms um, out to the island one at a time. And here's the swarm mount or swarm board we used. Oops. So this is a swarm and clustered around the caged queen here, little feeder bottles up here. These orange boards are there because it's really windy on this island. And the swarm was set up right at the top of the island. It's an old Coast Guard life-saving station building. So we put these windbreak boards up and we could camera here so we could video record the dance patterns of the scout bees. But the key part of this experiment was <clears throat> we'd set up the swarm in the middle of the island and over on this side of the island, I'd put out five nest boxes. And one of them would be would offer the scout bees a superb site and the other four would offer them mediocre sites. So this really is a multiple choice test. So put up one swarm, put up one of the boxes would be excellent over here and the other four are mediocre. And Here's what was, here's the boxes that I put out. Each one was a nest box and I could adjust the goodness of a, of a box for a home site by adjusting things like the size of the entrance and the size of the cavity. You may recall that I mentioned earlier that these like nest sites with small entrances like this and they're like a roomy nest cavity. So when I set up this experiment, I actually put always put up gave the nest box a small entrance. But what I varied was the amount of living space inside the box. If I, if I didn't put in this an inner wall, then it would be a 40 liter nest space, which is I, I knew that's what they really like. Or if I put the inner wall in right between the, this, this place here and this place here, it would be only 15 liters. And they would treat that as, uh, it, it's okay, we could live with it, but it's not great. So that was, that was the choice. I put out one box, 40 liters, and the other four would be 15 liters. And the question was, how well could they identify and choose the really good one? Let's see. And what I, these are the results for two of the trials to give you a feeling for actually how these experiments work. I put out the four boxes and there was five different places on the island. Back to the one, this fan-shaped array on the island. Five locations, five boxes. And in the first trial, trial one, I put out the four 15 liter boxes on 
the one side of the array and put the really good one on, at the other at the end of the array. And you can see that the scout, what I measured was the number of scouts visible outside a box. And it never got, those numbers stayed low at all the mediocre boxes. But once they found the good box, the number of scout bees at the box uh, grew strongly and eventually the swarm took off at the end of the day. So in the first trial, indeed, they chose the 40 liter box over any of the 15. So in a sense, that swarm uh, got it right. <laughs> There's a second trial was more complicated. They didn't, they didn't, they got, they started to get fairly interested in the, these two 15 liter box boxes until they found the 40 liter box. And then interest grew up here. And as it grew up at the 40 liter box, the number of scout bees visiting these two boxes faded away. And again, the swarm chose this box, took off and, and, and flew to it, flew to it. And one thing I want to note is that each swarm, we may or may not come back to this, but the scalpies know when a site has won in the competition uh, because they pay attention to how many bees are visible outside the box. And if they see a crowd of about 15, 10 to 15 bees outside a box, they know that that site has proven to be popular enough to, for it to be the new home. It's, in other words, they sense a quorum or a sufficient number of individuals interested in a site. They don't, we don't know if they measure the bees outside or they measure the bees inside, but we did find that if, if we saw 10 to 15 bees there, they knew that told us they were going to move to that site. Quorum sensing. Um, one thing I want to stress is these ex experiments did not always work smoothly. In fact, on the first trial, sometimes there was bad weather. But the first time I encountered some actually some competition on of, of home sites on the island. And what happened is I put out my five boxes and I was down and set up the swarm. And I was down at the boxes and I would go be checking one box to the next to the next. And I never saw any scout bees in my boxes. And I thought, yuck, what's happening? Is there something else on this island that's got their attention? I, and so I wondered where where are my bees going? And of course, thankfully, the bees, by doing their waggle dances, tell us where they're going. So I, I knew that I, I just went back to the swarm, and if I saw bees dancing, they would tell me where they were going. So I did that. Went back to the swarm, saw dancing bees, and here's what I figured. Here's what I learned. I learned that my bees were very interested in something over in this direction, and I carefully read the dances and got the direction information, and I got the distance information. And that told me that it was this house. There was something at or near this house that they thought was a dandy home site. And that was not good news because I was told when I came to Appledore Island, see Cornell doesn't own the whole island, it only rents part of the island. And there's this, pr there were private houses over here. And I was told not to go over to these houses, that's private property. And I was told that in particular, you don't, there's one house you don't want to go to. And that was the house that my bees were going to. So I, but I had to go over there to find out what was going on. And what I, when I did that, um, I found my scout bees going down in the chimney of the house of Rodney Sullivan. He was a lobster fisherman and um, he really liked his privacy, but and I, I was told if I came, went to his house, he would be really um, grouchy. <laughs> but in fact, when I arrived and I said, hmm, I'm, I think my bees are over here. <laughs> he was really happy because he was freaked out by the bees. He was wondering where on earth did these bees come from and what can I do about them? Because they're going in my chimney and they're coming down my chimney and going into my wood stove. I can hear them banging around in there. So I said, well, okay, well, let's Look, we can solve this problem. You build a little fire in your wood stove, make some smoke in there. That'll drive the bees out. And I'll, if you've got a ladder, and he did have a ladder, I'll get up on your roof and I'll climb up there with some old window screening and some duct tape, and I will screen off the top of your ch chimney. And um, that worked. And I'm glad I never had to do that again. I just left it up there because that, that roof was slippery with gull poop and was high up 
And if I slid off the roof, I would have fallen down into this sort of cavern down here, a ledge. It was, and um, but it worked, but managed to get up and down, screen off the and chimney safely, and not kill myself. <laughs> that was good. Highly recommend. So. This slide, you can see the question is, what did the individual scout bees do to choose the best site? Because all I've told you about so far is the, kind of the global pattern. We've seen that they go out, they find different sites, they perform dances for them. And somehow those dancing, that activity of the dancing coalesces on one of the sites. Now, how does that happen? That's really the heart of the, of the process. And when you can imagine, imagine a situation of people sitting around in a room and different people have proposed different things and you might take test votes to see where the op people's uh, opinions are, straw poll votes. You might Initially in a discussion, you might find people are voting for this and voting for that. But over time, if, if it's like the bees, the, the, vote, the votes will coalesce on one site. So how do the bees achieve coalescence? And again, here's, a, here's that diagram that shows how, the, how they built, co how they coalesced their interest on this one site. Back at the beginning of the discussion, that winning site was a very, didn't get many votes. It, only got, it was getting 13% of the bees were promoting it with their dances. And that, by the end of the first day, that proportion, that fraction had grown to 33%. By the um, middle of the morning on the second day, it had grown to 62%. It was getting, it was going towards 100%. Um, but it took until it wasn't until the third morning that it was 100%. Every bee that was dancing was was dancing for the winning site, site G to the southwest. So here's our two questions: the scout's interest grows and grows for the best site. How does that happen? And even what's maybe even more remarkable is the scout's interest fades for all the poor sites. How does that happen? And you, I think we all know from group discussions, it's hard to get build consensus, but the bees do it. And it's often hard because some people don't want to give up on things that they, they think are right. But the bees do that. Let's see what they do. Well, the way to think about this decision-making process is it's basically they're not actually trying to achieve a consensus. What they are doing is they're running a race, a race between groups of scouts to accumulate sufficient supporters of their site. Imagine the simplest situation, <clears throat> for example, a site A, which is a superb home site. It's good volume, small entrance, entrance is high off the ground, etc. And let's say there's another site, just one more site, site B, which is only so-so. And let's say both sites are discovered at a, really the same time. Well, the first bee and, they, and the other scouts that go to site A, they do strong dances. And I'll explain what I mean by strong dances shortly, basically long lasting dances. And so the number of supporters builds up strongly for this site. <clears throat> and, and I think we've got somebody that needs to mute their mic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you can mute uh, Arlene's uh, profile, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. For site B, on the other hand, the dances are weak. And so what happens is there are a lot more bees, will, a lot more supporters will be going to site A than site B, just because this, the advertising is stronger for a superb site than for a so-so site. And so this is a key feature of their decision making process. And it's one that we could, we, I wish we could emulate. The strength of a bee's dancing is a function of site quality. And this means that the evidence, i.e. the number of scalpies visiting the site, accumulates fastest for the best site. And it doesn't require, <clears throat> it's a little hard to explain this, but I want to explain that this, each scout bee only goes to one site. They don't go back and forth and compare the different sites. All they know is they go out, one bee starts out, one scout bee discovers site A and one bee discovers site B. But scout 
the scout from site A <clears throat> was more impressed by her site than the scout than was the scout from site B. She produced a long-lasting dance, as I'll show you shortly. So she attracted more recruits to her site than did the first B from site B. And the thing snowballs in just in favor of whichever site is the most attractive. So the evidence accumulates the fastest for the best site. Now I've talked about dance strength. What do I mean by dance strength? Well, I wasn't sure myself until I did this experiment where I put up a swarm on the island on the porch of another building on the island. And I put out just time, this time just two nest boxes. Again, one was very good and the other was only so-so. One was 40 liters and one was 15 liters. And I now I had the simpler situation of dancing for just two sites. And so I could compare the dances for the site to the good site and the poorer site, the so-so site. What did I find? On this again, this is the pattern of a dance. A bee does a waggle run on the surface of the swarm, then she does her walks back, she returns and does another waggle run. And the next time she'll generally go return in the other direction. And if the bee likes the site, she'll do a lot of these dance circuits. If it's not so good, as we'll see, she doesn't do as many dance circuits. And here's the, here's the actual pattern of the data. When the bee, the scout bees that came home from the dream home, the 40 liter box, well, if you counted the number of dance circuits produced per bee to advertise her site, you can see that the bees that came back from the dream home, well, they varied a great deal. Some did very few dances and a few did hundreds of dance circuits, but on average, they did 90 dance. A bee, a single scout bee would do 90 dance circuits to advertise the dream home. But the scout bees that inspected the fixer upper site, there was only 15 liters. They didn't do as many dance circuits. And so their dances weren't as compelling. They weren't as attractive. They weren't as, a, as effective as the dances for the dream home. And so that's what biases the buildup in favor of, the, of a dream home over a fixer upper. A scout bee judges her site's value and uh, the longer, the higher she judges its value, the longer on average she dances. And in this case, it was three minutes of dancing to advertise a dream home versus one minute. And that's a pr pretty big difference, three to one in terms of an advertising strength. The higher scout bee judges her site's value, the longer on average she dances. That's key. Now, and one other thing I want to stress, I think maybe mentioned it already, is the, a scout, the scouts don't compare sites. They don't have to go to this site and that site and realize, oh, this one's better than that one. Instead, they judge a site's absolute goodness. And they, as I mentioned before, they use, seem to use a built-in scale of quality. Like, um, and we, we have, they don't need to make comparisons. And we have that kind of phenomenon as well. We know what smells good and what smells bad. We don't have to learn what is a good smell and what's a bad smell. So the bees don't have to learn what's a good home site and what's a poor home site. They, they have that built-in knowledge as well. Now I want to share with you a diagram which summarizes what I've tried to explain in words, but I think is actually shown more effectively through this diagram. Imagine the situation you've, of a swarm of bees and it's, it's considering just two sites, but one of them is poorer than the other, and the other one is better than the other. And what makes this one better than this one is that it has a smaller entrance opening. Otherwise, let's say the two sites are identical. Now, and let's imagine just for the sake of this, as the example, that both, both the better site and the poorer site are discovered by one scout bee each at the very same time and that each scout bee comes back and does a dance at the, on the swarm at the same time. The difference is that the bee from the better site is going to do, and we'll indicate that by the blue color here, she will do her dance um, for three minutes on average, and this bee will dance for one minute on average. 
you know, if you can, that's at 10 o'clock. So the thing is just starting at 10 o'clock and they're both sites are found uh, at the very same time. Now, if you came back at 1 p.m. through several hours later, you would, you would see a pattern like this. <clears throat> you would see three times as many bees advertising, performing dances for this site than this site, because the first bee did dance, danced three times stronger than uh, the blue bee danced three times stronger than the red bee. So the recruitment is proportional to the duration of the dancing. So now we've got three times as many bees going to advertising this site than this site, and also more bees visiting this site than this site. And the thing, the situation just snowballs in favor of the better site, because now it's not just that each bee is dancing three times as much. Now there's three times as many bees advertising this site. So if you came back a few, some hours later, you would see that almost every bee on the swarm is now dancing for this site. And there's a lot of bees at visiting this site and not very many visiting this, this site. So again, the point is that nobody has to compare sites there's just a, a biased buildup of interest in the best site. And so the evidence accumulates fastest and most str strongly at the best option. And it turns out, we wondered at this point, how do the bees know, how do they tell whether their evidence is building up in favor of this site or this site? Do they? Do the scout bees walk around on the swarm and poll the dancers? No, it turns out they don't. What they do is they just go back to the site and they visit the site and they see if there's a lot of bees at the site or if there's just a few bees at the site. And if they encounter a lot of bees, if they encounter a lot of bees at the site, they know that that site is the best site that the scout bees have, that they, the scout bees have found. And then when they reach, when they realize that, then they organize the move to the new home. And this again is this quorum sensing. They go to the they go to their site, and if they see a lot of bees inside the cavity and flying around outside the cavity, they know that that a quorum has been reached at that home site, and that is the choice. So that's how things build up in favor of one site, and. What I haven't said, and I don't think I'll spend a lot of time explaining this, but why does the interest fade for all the poor sites? Well, it's a little tricky, but it's, in other words, the question is, why does scout bees from the poorer sites stop dancing? And we at first thought that maybe the scout bees compare the sites and go back and forth and switch to the better sites, um, or they might realize that their dancing is weaker than other bees and that would tell them to stop dancing. It doesn't work like that at all. It's, it's, more, it's more simple than that. Each, each scout visits and knows about just one site. But here's what happens. If you're a bee that has visited a superb site, well, I should explain that what this diagram shows is that as bees make multiple visits back to the swarm after visiting a site, they all have a decay of their dancing, of the strength of their dancing. So if a bee is, comes back from a superb site, the first time she comes back to the swarm and does a, does a dance, she might do 90 dance circuits. And then her next trip, then she, then she goes back to the site and checks it out again and sees how many other bees are there. But now on this next time back to the swarm, she won't do 90 dance circuits, she'll do 75. And then the next dance circuit, the next time she goes, comes back to the swarm, she'll do 60 and then 45 and then 30 and then 15 and zero. Um, so it takes, if a bee comes back from a superb site, her dancing decays, but it takes a long time. It takes a lot of visits to the site before her, before her dancing decays. But if a bee comes back having visited, inspected a good site, well, when she does her first dance, it's not, it's not gonna have very many dance circuits. She's not very enthusiastic about it. And she follows her dancing, strength of her dancing decays as well, but it decays quickly because she never was very excited in the first place. So the way they, the way they get the dancing and thus the interest to, 
the focus on one site is through this process of the bees having this decay of their dancing. Of course, the, dan the dancing on the whole overall will keep build, build up on the swarm because by the time this bee that visited the first site and discovered the superb site, by the time she stops dancing, she's, got a, she's brought a lot of other bees to that site and they themselves will dance for that site in a very strong fashion. And it's pretty brilliant, I think. It, it, it's a, having this decay function, when you think about it, 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 it um, guarantees that the inferior options, the fear, inferior potential home sites do not persist in the discussion. So this brings us back to looking, sort of stepping back and looking broadly at what the bees are doing right. And again, I'll say with the, you know, here I'm following up with this statement, with the right organization, democratic groups are remarkably intelligent. And that begs the question, what's the right organization? And Mr. Surowiecki didn't know it. He was on the right track, but he didn't have the example of the bees at the time. And so, but now we do, and we can, I'll share with you what I have learned about what I call the five habits of highly effective hives. These are lessons for good group decision making. And some human groups do have, without any knowledge of the bees, have settled on a lot of these methods. Um, the ones that I know best are the town meetings up in, up in Vermont. They, have, they follow these rules pretty well. The first of all, step one is, is if the group members can agree that they have a shared decision making goal. And for the bees, all the scout bees have a shared goal of choosing the best home site. And, and in the town, like the New England town meeting, they might all agree that, yeah, we, we, wanna, we wanna do what's best for our school system, something like that. The other thing that's good to do if a group's gonna make decisions effectively is if the group members possess diverse information, because you can only choose well among options if you've got actually a good variety of options to choose among. So you have to have diverse, diversity of information in the decision-making process. Then it's important, a third rule is that the group members share their information freely because sometimes you wanna make sure you tap into the, all of the knowledge or information that the members um, have because nobody, nobody is all wise and somebody might actually, might even be might be generally somebody that doesn't contribute a lot to the decision making, but they might have a good idea. And I, when I functioned as the chair of my department and we had to do group decision making about this or that, I knew there was one guy out there. He was very quiet, but I'd say, "Okay, Paul, what are your what are your thoughts on this? You haven't said anything." And then he'd say, "Well, nobody else will probably agree with me, but here's what I see. Here's how I see it." And oftentimes, uh, disproportionately. Uh, his his view would come up his idea would actually win the day in the end because people recognize it was a good idea and then the fourth thing is to have the group members express their judgments independently we humans are good about this we're pretty good about this we have voting systems that allow people to discreetly express their vote they don't do this in town meeting in vermont so that's one where one way in which they don't do so well um, but if it's a close vote and somebody can say, I want to do a valid vote and, and that's what they then do. And finally, the fifth rule is that the group aggregates its members judgments in an unbiased way, like one vote per person, uh, use majority rule or as the bees do it with quorum sensing. So these are the lessons that I've learned and, and have shared about good group decision-making and um, I have been invited by the military to talk about this and corporations to talk about this. And the military says, they, they were very revealing to me. And they said, in a, um, when, when the chips are down in, in a military group and things are really difficult, and that's just basically what they do. They just sit down and say, what, you know, or get together and say, what are we gonna do? Uh, uh, rank doesn't disappear, but it, it, it's, it's no longer a judgment call just by the highest ranked individual in the group. And yeah. so 
what I've shared with you is um, only a kind of an overview of the whole story. And if you'd like to learn more about it, I, I wrote this book, Honeybee Democracy, and it tells it in greater detail and probably more clearly than I've been able to share it today.